Uh, welcome to the Fire Station Creative. Uh, today we are privileged to have international fine artist Maria Rudd. Maria has had numerous, numerous exhibitions in many countries across the world, including Russia, Sweden, Switzerland and the UK. She's painted and performed uh, a multimedia extravaganza with her truly or original creation, which is called The Animotion Show. Um, she started this with Evelyn Glennie, the classical musician. And uh, so I'm just going to start, Maria. Um, you were born in Moscow, is yes, that right? that's right. Soviet Union time. Uh, I guess so. Soviet time. So well, to be fair, for me, Moscow is always Moscow. It doesn't matter where it was. Right, so it's a, it's a bit like London. It's got its own kind of... You know, it's its own world, it really, is. compared to the it rest is, of the country. It is, and especially my own world was mm -hmm. my art school. Right, and, and, and you studied from age seven, sorry. Yes. Yeah. And were you in that art school from age seven, or was that a progression from The preliminary school? studies were from age of seven, yeah. and then professional studies were from the age of nine. Profession so you studied professionally from nine years old? Yes. Wow. So did you feel pressure there? No. No no pressure. No. And um was art always was it always a, a given that you'd be an, an artist and study to be an artist? Was that the only thing you, that you cared about really? I, I knew that I have to be a painter since I was two. Oh. And that's the first time I remember myself. So your identity is uh, as a painter, really. Your core is paint, painting. I, I was lucky I didn't have a choice. I mean, mm -hmm. maybe it's lucky to have a choice, mm -hmm. but I think I'm very grateful that I didn't because it gives you a very clear perspective. Mm -hmm. Because you have to do it. Mm -hmm. You are driven to do it and you have a knowledge of what you have to do. And in that way, you probably feel always and forever humble mm -hmm. because it's something within you. Mm -hmm. And your mother was a pianist. My mother was a virtuoso pianist, but she had an accident. Um, and it's a very same accident which composer called Schumann had, um, the ligament on her hand basically broke and she could oh. no longer withstand the career of a concert pianist. Too, so, de too demanding. So she um, started writing music. She discovered that she is naturally a composer and that was wonderful. She, she was a great composer. Mm -hmm. The, well, the way you're speaking, it sounds... I mean, your dad was a scientist as well, and he was a, a respected yes. scientist. My, and, 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 yeah, my dad was an incredible yeah. scientist. And so did that make you... Did that give you any privileges within the communist system? It kind of sounds like you've... You know, it, it sounds a little bit like you were more, more uh, on a different level from, from ordinary uh, members of the Communist Party. Well, to be fair, um, uh, my father was nearly executed during Stalin's time. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't think it's a privilege. <laughs> and I, I was just born in a family of uniquely talented people. Mm. I think people uh, who were creative or members of so-called intelligentsia mm -hmm had very hard time uh, mm. during Stalin's regime. Yeah. And I think it was horrific. And I think it's what made them strong, light, resilient and giving. Mm -hmm. It was never um, it, it was never like a doom and gloom. It's it's made them who were were exceptional. Mm. I, I think yeah, but um I suppose the school I went to, you can call it a school for privileged kids, but it was privileged by um, 
well, it's, it's a very obnoxious thing to say, but talent. Mm. So, y- y- you know, you had children from, whose parents were from all walks of life. It, 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 you know, we weren't privileged. Mm-hmm. Um, and all you had to do is to, well, A, be talented and B, work hard. <laughs> and did you do that? Did you work hard? Very hard. Hard worker? Yes. Yeah. I believe in being hard work. Yeah. And uh, did your did your family and, and yourself, did you feel that you were separate from the system? Or did you feel, did you feel, I mean, it's a, probably a weird question to ask, but for Westerners looking at the Soviet system, did you feel like a communist or what, what did you no, feel like? No, of course not. Look, first of all, in my era, Soviet was near collapse and then it's collapsed. Mm-hmm. Um, that's one thing. Mm-hmm. So I can't claim I've known Soviet very well. My parents did, but I can't say I did. Secondly, the art school which I went to was extraordinary and one of a kind. And I can't say I lived in, well, I can't say I lived in any kind of society of any kind apart from uh, the society where creativity was the main thing. So, um, in in Russia, in in Soviet times, certain art forms or were, were were not allowed you know they were banned or or and you 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 love modernism i think that's what what i, I get from from your painting which is wonderful well um, i haven't seen that you i never have saw that. no no i haven't seen that but yes of course it was very um prominent um uh, you know before my time so to speak uh you had to be you were obligated to work as a painter, for example, in a certain style, which was um, Soviet realism. Uh, You were not... um, But then, you know... So it wasn't as bad as... Obviously, the worst example of that is is the Nazis' degenerate art, you know, exhibition and and how certain types of art were were spurned and... and, uh, relegated to the dustbin well, of history for a while. During Stalin's time, of course. It was right. like exactly like that. And, uh, you know, basically all the way after, even during Khrushchev's time, it was mm. also like that. The, You know, if you look at history, mm. um, all regimes of all kind, uh, regardless of what they are, they impose um, a lot of create a lot of boundaries for art simply because art is able to convey things without saying very much and have a strong impact. So, um, and also people in the arts, you know, as a musician, you can, your word is important to your followers. So you can influence people. Mm -hmm. Um, And obviously no regime wants that. Mm -hmm. So, well, we'll move along. Yeah, um, the wall came down. Do you remember? Of course, I. Eighty nine, when the yes. wall came, but the Iron Curtain came down. In fact, yeah. yeah. And uh, how did it feel in Moscow at that point? You know, did it amazing? Was, was that a se- oh, incredible time of celebration? Was it? Oh, yeah. it was incredible. It was incredible. Of course, it mm. was absolutely wonderful. So both sides of the wall were happy. Un- amazing! It was amazing. Mm. Yeah. Well, look. It was when people, it was a very special time Mm. and it was a time of sort of altruistic euphoria, shall we say, Mm. Mm. especially amongst the young people, Mm. because people had something, it's always good to look forward to something. Mm. And then you have a lot of people who have this incredible energy and then they suddenly what was impossible suddenly is not only possible, mm. it's real. It's like a miracle, you know, and it's wonderful, you know. The energy was incredible. But you would be, you know, you'd still be studying. You had, yeah. you, you ended up um, completing a degree in uh, film. 
Yes, I did it in parallel. Yeah. And the reason I did it is because I see images. Images come to me. They come to me um, more or less completely formed. And they're not static. They're always alive. They're moving. They are... So what I see is a little bit like... A, an image on TV screen, right? And sometimes I have very good reception. Sometimes I have not so good reception. So uh, when the reception is good, very good, it's not very often, then the painting will be good. When the reception is not so good, um, I have to either wait or try to sort of transform it myself. But... It's always movement. And because of that, since I was a child, I've seen images to music where we're moving, transforming, mm -hmm. like a film. Mm -hmm. I believed that I have to work in film because of what I've seen. And, and also it's a medium which is very, well, it um, combines a lot of different mediums together. It's a, it's a separate language, which brings together many languages, creative languages. So I wanted to, understandably as a painter, to be in animation. I don't mean like what you refer to as cartoon, but a kind of art animation. So that, that kind of leads a, a lot. And, and you became, so you studied in film and then you became a painter. Or you, you, you well, always, I've, you I've always never were, stopped being a yeah, painter. Yeah, you always were a painter. <laughs> yeah. But you pursued a life as a painter. Yes. To some degree. Although uh, you did, you were, you were, um, you were, you were headhunted by a, a company in Norway to design glasswork for them. Well, it wasn't like that. I had exhibitions. I had wonderful exhibitions in Stockholm, Sweden. Mm. Um, I came to Stockholm on Totally, I felt very strong affinity with Stockholm. I absolutely love Stockholm. It's like my hometown. Um, and I fell in love with Swedish glass. Now, Swedish glass is very different from, well, Scandinavian glass. It's very different. And... Uh, I've never seen glass used in that way to create art. You know, I knew stained glass. Mm -hmm. I knew, you know, um, glass as a decorative medium, mm -hmm. craft, but I've never seen art glass. I was spellbound. And I think, you know, America is quite big on, on art glass as well, but there are not many countries which have you know, brought art, uh, sorry, brought glass onto that level of art. Mm -hmm. It's magical. Mm -hmm. So I fell in love and just like in uh, some kind of story, I happened to meet more or less by chance, almost on the street, people who were at the helm of Swedish glass industry. And I was drawing, I became obsessed, so I was drawing pieces of glass, I, I didn't have the craft. You know, now I'm a great believer that you need to learn the craft. But I wanted, you know, I just saw this glass and I, you know, I was constantly drawing. And they said, would you like to see it made? And I was like, oh my God. And a couple of weeks later, it was real. So, and then, so you got you got a bug you you got the bug for it you wanted to see yeah, well, your so drawings they, converted so they, into reality. So they um, paid for me, well sponsored me, mm -hmm. to go to a glass factory in Sweden called Linshammer Glassbrook in Småland, a beautiful region which is all used to be glass making. Mm -hmm. And then they had an exhibition. I learned how to make glass in Sweden, and. It, it, it's very addictive. 
and I just was totally in love with it. And um, I had an exhibition, and then I was invited to work for Swedish Glass Factory as a principal designer, which was, you know, incredible for me. And of course, I continued painting. And then I, of course, agreed. So that's how I got stuck in Sweden. And how then, many years? Sorry, how many years were you in Sweden? Oh, just three years. Just three, yeah. But then I, a Swedish factory I w was working with was bought by Norway, and that's how I ended up working for Magnor Glasswerk in Norway, which is another wonderful factory. Amazing. So, so you're developing, uh, you're developing different skills. You're always a painter, but you studied. Uh, film, and now you're into glass, and then I think you moved well, into um, creating fashion items as well. Yes, uh, well, you and my partner and I had a cultural project called Dome, which this is what how does we that stand for. Dome stands for home in Russian. Home. Home. Right, okay. Like as in domicile, kind of. Thing. Exactly. Yeah. Domicile. So we. We came to Edinburgh, uh, I mean, I, you and comes from the north of England, mm -hmm. I have to point that out, mm -hmm. uh, because he, he loved Edinburgh, but he only been to Edinburgh as a teenager, a child. So he gave a good press to Edinburgh, uh, or Scotland. For, of course, you. well, yeah. you and always loved Scotland. Well, he even has Scottish name, but um, obviously it's because his dad, gave him uh, and his dad and his mom gave him a name you and who they also loved scotland but um you and never lived in scotland and we met in in sweden and we decided that we actually been thinking of going to amsterdam initially and i had an obsession with mary queen of scots since i was a child mm. i mean and i would say an obsession and uh, I was bizarrely obsessed with another book by Erasmus of Rotterdam, which is called Edinburgh Prison. It's oh. a bit obscure. So, and uh, as a child, I was obsessed with Mary Queen of Scots. I, I, I can tell you, uh, well, I mean, I can't tell you everything about Mary Queen of Scots, but I, I, I just, so I um, always wanted to see Edinburgh. And we came to Edinburgh, and it happened so we started the cultural project, which uh, together with uh, a lot of wonderful people from different countries, including Latvia, including Russia, including Sweden, including Norway, and of course, Scotland. Mm -hmm. But the project was about um it was a slightly ahead of its time uh i think um it was loved by the general public we were very independent and very altruistic we um had a permanent exhibition and recital space in the old town Put about exactly. Advocates close. Advocates close, right? Okay. Yeah, and people absolutely loved it. They loved it so much. It was a three-story building, and we uh, we actually leased it. We had a lease, so you know it wasn't given to us or anything. And that we would have been, was that not very expensive? The centre of Edinburgh. Well, to be fair, um, the council at the time. Uh, well, Dome actually is uh, mentioned in uh, 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 we in the inauguration of Scottish Parliament, and we um, we've been very fortunate that the council at the time gave us the lease. It was a commercial lease, but they kept it at the lower level, even though we were competing with other, you know, architect firms and things like that. Um, and the public loved it. 
the public adored it. Mm. And we also had, the public adored it. And we had thousands and thousands what, what, of people. What was on show there? Okay, um, paintings, sculptures, tapestries, glass uh, by uh, artists from Scotland, from England, from Norway, from Sweden, from New Zealand, from France, from Latvia, and so on. Uh, Germany and we. So w w would that really be like more like a gallery than a, the, the? It was like a public gallery, right, a public okay, space. Yeah. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't a commercial mm -hmm. space. It was public space. Great. Uh, we so all, is, all. Is this connected to? Um, are, are we moving on to your your shop in Paisley? It, it, it was like a world. No, the shop wasn't in Paisley. The factory, the factory we worked with. Yeah. So in order to, and we also staged mini festivals. Some during Fringe, uh -huh. some outside of Fringe, um, which brought in not only art and music to the public, but films as well. Yeah. And yes, people really loved it. Mm -hmm. In order to sustain this project, we launched a retail and manufacturing company called Kingdom without a G. Keen as the next of Keen and Dom as in Dom. And we worked with a lot of wonderful com companies and wonderful factories. We made the point of only producing things in either Scotland or England or Norway mm. or Sweden. Okay, that's, um, that, that's really fascinating. That's something I've never uh, talked to you about before, really. Um, yeah, it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful project. Yeah. You see, I lament the dome, which uh, I think Jim Gilchrist wrote a beautiful article about dome when dome kind of ended. I think I lament the fact that dome uh, building now is, what do you call it, Airbnb? Oh my God. Yes, exactly. This I is think the way it goes. Yeah, I think this is, it makes me sad. So how, how, how does the pit... The Paisley factory fit into the story. Is that anything to do with Dom or is that a, a completely yes, different Yes, yes, with Kingdom. We manufactured um, mainly accessories and, um, you know, sort of, ac it, it was accessories for your wardrobe uh -huh. and for your home. Because you said you loved the staff there. Yes, we, yes, absolutely yeah. did. And and so I did love the staff in Fife. Uh -huh. We worked with a wonderful factory yeah. here in Aloha. But anyway, the point is that I don't know if you know about, well, you do know about Bauhaus, yeah? Yeah. Vienna Werkstatt. Mm -hmm. uh, and also Charles René Mackintosh. All of these, they we took a kind of blueprint, the mentality, our, our basic principle was we sort of took from them that everybody should have beautiful and affordable things and everything should be art. So our merchandise was designed by artists and manufactured. We been a little bit before our time because we've probably been amongst the pioneers of upcycling because we used only end of lines. It, it, I, I don't want to go very much into it because it's it's huge mm, material. Yeah, yeah. But anyway, we have to move on anyway. Yeah, Paisley factory, since you mentioned it, was one of the factories which we worked with, collaborated with and who produced our handbags, our scarves, mm -hmm. and what have you, and, and people there, it was like a family. It was amazing. Mm -hmm. what, what, what did the ladies in Paisley make of you? Because you're quite an unusual character, aren't you? Oh, I love them <laughs> and we loved each other. You're joking. Look, people who work, hardworking people, they always get on mm -hmm. because they're united by work they create. You know, I love being a factory for me is a natural place. And I've never been a designer who sits in a studio and sort of designs and then goes, no, that's wrong. It, you know, I've always been working alongside mm -hmm. the people because I believe that we just create a product. Mm -hmm. And also, I also believe that people at 
factories should be given creative freedom because that's another story. But anyway. it's quite similar to to what I heard. Tracy Emin, who's not you know loved and hated in equal measures across across Britain, I think. But um, she she kind of bemoaned the fact that she she become successful because she couldn't sit with the ladies and make the you know how she does tas tapestry. And that she she just wanted to sit and, and make with 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 the and instead of being like you said a designer who passed over the work to someone well else. nothing uh, can prevent her from doing it that's true I'm true. sorry <laughs> that is a very wrong thing because I believe nothing prevents you from going to a factory mm -hmm. it doesn't matter who you are so all of these myriad abilities that you developed over over time of, of kind of the some of them at least uh, uh, of coagulated in a in the idea of what was the animation show which was you i mean you paint what on is a, the animation show hmm? animation show is alive well yeah it's um, not dead okay <laughs> uh I, I was gonna say uh, you know but it, it, it's developed hasn't it I mean, you, you you do work with different people in, in that sort of way, in that sort of mode of, of performance and, yes. and art. Yes, um, And you work with Evelyn Glennie, who's a, a, a renowned um, classical per musician. Well, she's a percussionist. Yeah. She's um, probably, uh, she's a very unique uh, musician because she is a solo percussionist, which is incredibly uh -huh. rare. Yeah. You started to develop, develop this idea of um, painting live and having it projected on onto large areas like the f like architecture and uh, you've yes. had various propositions about how to do that yes. on, the, on the coast of Dover. Yes. I seem to remember one of the one of the ideas uh, was. Uh, it wasn't my idea. It was the yeah. idea of Brighton International <laughs> Festival, and uh -huh. that it, it was impossible to implement. But we did uh, amazing show on great buildings like Belfast City Hall, mm -hmm. Durham Cathedral. And you took it to China as well? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, well, Aurora Nova, um, Berlin, took mm -hmm. it to China, to America, mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. all over Europe. Uh, so uh, could you just explain uh, what actually happens at one of these shows? Which, I mean, we're going to get on to shamanic, oh, but shamanic's okay. the same principle. It uh, uses the same concept, mm -hmm. but it's a step further, I would say. So. I um, I will explain this. As a child, because my mama was a composer and a musician, I used to go to rehearsals. I also used to go to a lot of classical music concerts. And I used to, when you're three or four year old, or even five year old, it's sometimes very difficult to sit through the whole concerto. And it wasn't difficult for me because I saw images, a sequence of images, like a film. And only when I was about 10, I discovered that not everyone sees it. So, and then I thought as a child, my God, how can we withstand sitting there, you know, if I don't see anything? Mm -hmm. Because uh, it's a very sterile environment, you know, the concert hall, you know, it's... Mm -hmm. um, the comfortable chair, of course, but it's not, you know. So um, I always seen images to music, like a developing sequence of images, mm. like a, a live storyboard. Mm. And then Natalia, who is a great artist and animator, and I think you met her. Mm -hmm. And I went in Edinburgh and we decided, we had an exhibition and we decided that we can't have an exhibition opening because it's so boring. Because people stand around with glasses of champagne mm -hmm. or whatever mm -hmm. wine and look at each other. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And talk to each other. I mean, and the work is alive. Mm, so mm. we thought, how can we give people this experience that mm. work is alive? And we thought, oh, 
we use this. So we quickly put together a team. It was um, a folk musician called Nula Kennedy and um, the videographer Matcha Hanneman and the two of us. Mm. And we just did it. Mm. And people loved so you're, it. You're draw- but you're, you're painting on a, a, a light box, which yeah, is we projected. Developed, yeah, we developed it. We developed it in the space of, I think, a week. Uh-huh. So uh, people can idea. see. Can people can see the the images being created yeah. as they happen? Yeah. So yeah. you paint on a light box. Yeah. You can't develop a sequence because mm-hmm. it's basically you paint on glass. Mm-hmm. So you take away the image and it develops into another image. Mm-hmm. You have a camera mm-hmm. above your light box which projects onto either a screen or, uh, sorry, which is connected to projector. Mm. And that live feed goes out from projector onto architecture or onto a screen or onto a wall, any surface, mm-hmm. depending on what you need and what projector so you it's, have. So it's magic. Yeah. You, you, it's magic. You, you see images, I suppose it's in a way it's you given everyone what you have naturally, which is a, a capacity to see yeah. images happening yeah, in your mind's yeah, eye. Yeah, yeah. So so yeah. you paint in that way. But, sorry <laughs> to interrupt. The most important thing is it's impossible without music. So it's a collaboration between music and painting. Mm-hmm. So images are born with music. Without mm-hmm. music, for me, this is pointless and doesn't mm-hmm. exist. Mm-hmm. And the other interesting thing is that in music, when you play a guitar, mm. it goes to, or you sing, it goes to the audience via PA system. Mm. It doesn't go straight. So it goes through the mics and then to PA system. So if you imagine, there's no difference between the mic and the camera, between projector and the PA system. So it's exactly the same mm. principle. And that's why it's so fascinating for me personally. So, and then they sort of meet. Mm. So I, I know that you you have told me that you, that you used to. So it's like you're a musician, or, yes. or it's like the musicians are painters yes, together. Exactly. And it's like what what we call in music a jam. You know, yes, you make it a, yes. And you used to do that with Nigel Kennedy. That used to last for hours. You told me that, that the pair of you used to paint and or you painted and he played violin. Oh no, and that, but that wasn't. That was just. The, I was just painted on paper. That was paper. just pleasure. No, no. I, I've never ever. We never did the show. No, I, I know you didn't do the show, but it's that kind of. Um, but I always, yes, I always painted. It's a synchronicity yes. between the. It's the a synchronicity. Yes, and the, in, and the, it's you know, a synchronicity. Yeah. The notes. Yeah. yeah. So, you 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 came across this, or you stumbled across this kind of way of communicating with musicians, and now you can paint while people play live. Bands play lives, like myself and Faye Fife from the Rosillos, and and we create this thing together. We create these things together. Mm. It's impossible. It's not. You see, when you create a show, when it becomes bigger than a sum mm. and parts, mm. if you have um, music and painting really coming a synergy, yeah, mm. then people have multi-dimensional experience. And they can hear the color. You know, they can hear the. Is that called synesthesia? And they can see. When people feel it. And they can see music. Yeah. Yes, exactly. It's it's, It's synesthesia. Exactly. It's actually a problem to to some sound mixers who have it because they can't concentrate on listening because they keep seeing colors. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, It's exactly. mm -hmm. And I think having. Images developing through music, uh-huh. um, or vice versa. You know how sometimes we music develops. Sometimes, you know what I was finding interesting in working with some soloists, a classical soloist, is that, <clears throat> and Evelyn did this. She always it, it was always like she started using percussion instruments like a brush and I started using brush as percussion instruments uh, unconsciously but we that was very interesting Mm -hmm. so even Mm -hmm. physically Mm -hmm. 
I started using brushes as a mm -hmm. percussion, and, and she started using percussion instrument as a brush. Mm -hmm. And that was very interesting. It's like tribal or primal, the, the feeling that happens between the music musicians and the painter. And how you know the the f the feeling is quite um, overwhelming at, at times. I mean, I, looking back on the quad, which was the first time I performed with Shamanic, a very short short notice, I must add. Uh, Not such a short <laughs> notice. It was a short notice. Yeah, but it was uh, quite an experience for me. I'd I'd, I'd never seen anything like it before, and um, I was really proud to be part of it and and grateful to be involved. And uh, yeah, and, and now we have this amazing thing which which we've worked on for a few years together. And um, and at this time, I mean, your mother was Ukrainian. Uh, uh, no, she was born... Well, she Ukraine. was from Ukraine. Yeah, which was born from, in uh, Kiev. Yeah. And, and so grew up in Kharkov. So, and you've, you've got relatives in, in Ukraine. and um, In Kiev. So you have now this the emotional split that, that, you, that you've got to... Or you you don't have the split. The world has the split, and it, it's kind of a, it has an effect on you. I know it had an effect on you when 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 war started in Ukraine. I have to say, mm -hmm. I always hate it, and will always hate war of any kind. I had when I remember when I was I don't know uh, a war in Afghanistan, mm -hmm. and then when I was here, a war in Afghanistan. I've never even been to Afghanistan. I don't know anything about Afghanistan. But I felt pain, physical pain. And I always mm. feel physical pain mm. when I feel war. Mm. And I always feel it's coming. Mm. I feel it's coming before it happens. Mm. I'm not a political person. But I believe you said something which strikes a chord with me. War is a mental illness. It's when people go mad. Mm. As we lose all values which we should have mm. from a moment we're born, mm. war is the most horrible thing. Mm. And of course, when it concerns Moscow, where I was born, my home city, Kiev, where my mom was born and, you know, where she was raised, mm. Uh, and, you know, also had family in Odessa as well as Kharkov. Mm. And my father is from St. Petersburg. But also, if you think about it, how, it, how terrible it is that potentially, yeah, this war presents a real change for humanity mm -hmm. and not a good one. Mm -hmm. And so we should all do our best to help for that not to happen. I think you've got a strong feeling that the art is a powerful tool against that kind of suffering. In the same way Picasso re regarded art as a, as a weapon almost. Well, uh, <clears throat> Picasso said that... But it was a weapon for peace. He said, I think, I don't know if I can... Well, obviously, I, I don't know if a quote is correct, but it's something along the lines that uh, paintings are not created to decorate living rooms. Painting is an instrument of war. So, uh, and I think music, painting, literature, uh, yes, it's a spiritual way to, um, it's natural for any artist or musician to have compassion, because art is about compassion and love. It's, it's not about self-expression or self-love or to me, anyway, I do not accept art as self-expression. For me, mm -hmm. I just, you know, I, I mean, I'm happy people do it. You know, I don't judge it. But I don't, I can't identify with anything because to mm -hmm. me, 
art is not about self-expression. Well, that's a great, I think this is a great place to end the interview. So thanks very much, Maria, for, for speaking to us. And uh, Shamanic, the Shamanic show is on the 29th of October at Edinburgh International Conference Centre. And um, you can get more details on shamaniclive.com or mariarods.com, is that right? Uh, www.shamaniclive.com That's the best place. Well, thanks yes, a lot, Maria. Um, uh, www.mariaradart.com Maria Rod Art. Rod with one D. Rod with one D. Okay. All right. Thank you, Maria.